Elephant Run, chapters 9 through 12. Chapter 9, Freestone Island. Nick rode up front with Inda and Miss Pretty. Just behind them, Mia, unhappy about giving up her spot on her beloved elephant, was with Nick's father on Chow, and taking up the rear was Hilltop on Hannibal. The iron bell's clang made Nick a little nervous, but the mysterious monk seemed to have the testy bull firmly in hand. Perhaps he did really know the secret of the language of elephants. Nick wanted to ask Inda about his father's plans, but the tangled jungle put a stop to any conversation. The island was dark, damp, and filled with swarms of biting insects. Most of the time they had to ride bent over with their faces flat against Miss Pretty's back so they didn't get scraped by the low hanging branches. Within minutes, Nick was covered with bites and scratches and he wasn't the only one suffering. Inda had several gashes in his head. Nick caught a few backward glances of his father. He was totally disheveled, his clothes sopping wet and his hair disarrayed with clinging sticks, leaves and dirt. Mia was not faring much better. Nick wasn't able to see Hilltop, who had dropped farther behind, but he suspected that the monk was even worse off than they were, as Hannibal was a good three feet taller than the other elephants. After what seemed like an eternity, they broke into a more open area, deep in the island's interior. What's going to stop the Japanese from finding the elephants here? Nick asked Inda. The monsoon, he answered. When the annual rains come, the river will swell and become a rushing torrent. Nothing will be able to cross from the mainland, and the elephants will not be able to leave the island. When the rains stop, the elephants will be used to it here and will not want to leave. Where exactly are we going to release him? Well, that depends on where the wild elephants are. Your father will ride into the herd on Chow, and Hilltop will ride Hannibal. When they are ready, Hilltop will climb onto Chow, and they will leave Hannibal behind. The opposite of an elephant capture, Nick said. Exactly. Nick had read all about animal ca elephant captures and had always wanted to participate in one. If his father had his way about Australia, this was about as close as Nick was going to get to seeing one. I hear you're taking Mia and me to India, Nick said. True, Inda said. Why are we going on elephant back instead of driving? Inda smiled. Elephants are slower than trucks, but they don't need petrol. They don't need roads and they don't break down. We will have to stay off the main roads to avoid the Japanese patrols. I don't want to go, Nick said. Inda was silent for a few moments, then said, Burma will soon be a very unpleasant place to be. My family is very grateful your father has offered to send Mia with you. She will be safe in Australia. Mia is Burmese, Nick pointed out. The Japanese are at war with the British and Americans. Mia is also very pretty, Inda said. It would be better for her to be a long way from here. Nick hadn't considered Mia in that way. She is pretty, he thought. Beautiful, really. It hadn't occurred to him that she might be in danger from the Japanese because of her good looks. But this still didn't explain why he had to go to Australia, and he was about to pursue the subject when Inda brought Miss Pretty to a sudden stop. Elephant dung, Inda said, jumping to the ground. He put his hand into the dung, fresh. Nick got down, too, happy to stretch his legs. The herd's close. Inda whispered, we'll have to be quiet from here on. Nick's father and Amya ambled up behind and joined them. His father looked at the dung and the direction of the tracks. A moment later, Hilltop arrived on Hannibal. Here's how we're going to work this, his father said to Inda. Hilltop and I will take the lead on Hannibal and Chow. Mia will ride with you and Nick. When we get to the herd, hold Miss Pretty back. We'll ride in. If we have a problem, drop Mia and Nick off and come pick us up. Mia, Inda nodded. Mia and I will go ahead. 
a little on foot and see if we can spot them. Quietly, his father said. It didn't take Mia and Inda long to spot the wild elephants. The small herd was foraging on the edge of a large clearing. Mia had seen wild elephants, but never this many and never this close. We should head back to get and get the others, Inda whispered. Reluctantly, she followed her brother, but stopped several times to glance back at the wild herd. About halfway to where Mr. Firestone, Freestone was waiting for them, Inda stopped and put his shoulder back on the ground. What are you doing, Mia asked. This is about as good a time as any. Well, for what? He reached into his bag and pulled out something wrapped in a burlap rice sack. What is it? Open it. Mia untied the string. Under the crude wrapping was the most beautiful tune she had ever seen. The teak handle was beautifully carved with elephants, their tusks inlaid with ivory. I made it for you, Inda said, and would have given it to you sooner, but I knew father would be unhappy because it would just encourage your desire to become a Mahot. I guess it doesn't matter now. Tears filled Mia's eyes. Inda held her close. I wish you didn't have to go, he said, but the tune will remind you of home. Someday you'll be back, and perhaps you'll be able to use this tune if I have anything to say about it. I'll make you the first female Mahot on the Freestone Plantation. You are already better with elephants than half of the Mahots here. Mia wiped her eyes. Whether I get to use the tune or not, it's the most wonderful present I've ever received. She gave her brother a kiss. Of course, you're going to be able to use it a little, sister. We have a very long ride to India. And as far as I'm concerned, you are Miss Pretty's Mahot. I'm just going along for the ride. He took Mia's hand and led her back to the others. Can I borrow your knife? Nick's father asked. Nick fished it out of his pocket and gave it to him. His father walked over to Hannibal, cut the rope holding the iron bell, and then walked back and handed both the bell and the knife to Nick. A memento, he said. A souvenir. Nick stood awkwardly in front of his father with the bell in one hand and the knife in the other. Perhaps you should keep the knife, he offered again. His father smiled. No, it's yours now. I just wish I could have given you more than a knife and a rusty bell. I want to stay here with you, Nick said. You can't, son. I'm sorry. What about after the war? If we can't come back here, we'll do something in Australia or somewhere else. But wherever we end up, it won't be like this. He looked up through the thick trees. I told you that the sergeant major set this island aside so we could know what the land looked like. Nick nodded. Well, he continued, I'm not sure if that was his real purpose. Every time I come here, I'm reminded just how tough the sergeant major was. I think he left it this way so you and I would know what it was like. This island is your grandfather's and great-grandfather's heart. It beats in both of us. Nick would find himself thinking about this many times in the next several months. Ah, here come Inda and Mia, his father said. Inda told them where the elephants were. Then Mia showed off her new tune to everyone's delight. Nick was impressed with the carvings. They were better than the sergeant majors. If you want, Inda offered, I can teach you how to carve on our way to India. I'd like that, Nick said, but he still had no intention of going. We'd better get moving, his father said. Inda held Miss Pretty back as they watched Nick's father and Hilltop ride Hannibal and Chow across the clearing toward the herd. Nick balanced on his knees, holding a pair of binoculars in one hand and the saddle with the other. He counted nine elephants, but there may have been even more hidden in the tall grass. His father and Hilltop kept their hands and heads down 
so their silhouettes would not frighten the herd as they approached. As they drew closer, a couple of elephants flared their ears and trumpeted. But other than that, there was little commotion over the new elephants. Chow stuck to Hannibal's side as if he were glued to him. They worked their way closer and closer until they were right in the middle of the foraging herd, blending in so well it was difficult for Nick to keep track of them. Hilltop stretched forward towards Hannibal's left ear and appeared to be talking to him. When he finished, he clambered onto Chow. Nick's father backed Chow out of the herd, turned him, then started back across the field at a fast walk. Nick kept the binoculars on Hannibal, wondering if some of the elephants in the herd were related to him. Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, perhaps his mother or father was with the herd. It had only been nine years since his capture, and elephants are long-lived. Hannibal got into pushing a pushing match with a smaller elephant, shoving it a good 50 feet away before returning to the herd. His father rode up. Nick handed him the binoculars. He watched the herd a while, then said, He's making himself right at home. I just hope he stays here until the monsoon. He looked at Hilltop. How many elephants can we bring here? Hilltop thought about it for a few moments. Uh, I'll be able to tell you precisely how many in a few days. So you're staying on the island, his father said. Not sounding surprised, Hilltop climbed down from Chow. I'll get word to you as soon as I know. In the meantime, you can bring over two or three elephants. The island can certainly take that many more. Inda saw some food and put it into Hilltop's bag and handed it down to him. The old monk slung it over his narrow shoulder, then looked up at Mia and Nick. I won't be seeing you for some time. Travel safely. Australia is, some in is interesting and has some interesting animals. Many of them have pouches on their bellies and only come out at night. You've been there? Nick asked. He nodded. Even his father seemed surprised to hear this, but he didn't allow them to discuss it any further. We had better go. I want you to get back across the river before dark. Dark, Nick, you ride with me. Nick climbed on to Chow behind his father. Mia climbed on to Miss Pretty in front of her brother. She's all yours, Inda said. Mia tucked her feet behind Miss Pretty's warm ears and tapped her with her tune, and they headed back toward the river. Nick wanted to talk to his father about Australia again, but felt it would be better to ease into the subject. What's Hilltop looking for on the island? Elephants, for one thing, his father answered. There may be another herd, maybe more than one. If too many elephants get stranded on the island during the monsoon, all the elephants could starve. He'll look at food sources and try to determine how many elephants the island can sustain. What happens after the monsoon? Won't the elephants leave the island? Uh, some of them will, but then they'll be firmly established in herds. In order to be useful to the Japanese, they would have to be captured and retrained, which could take months to accomplish. I doubt the Japanese would bother with them. Nick looked at him in the waning light. The exertion of the long day and many nights of sleepless worry were obvious on his father's weary face. He didn't have the heart or the energy to bring up Australia right then. He decided to save his final argument for the following morning after they both had some rest. Chapter 10, The Enemy. It was dark by the time they got across the river and set up camp. After they ate, Nick's father went to sleep. Inda, Mia, and Nick stayed up a little while longer talking. Inda pre predicted it would take at least a month to get to India on Miss Pretty, and much longer if they ran into trouble along the way. He was taking them to a friend of Nick's father named Mr. Singh. From there, Nick and Mia would be put on a train to Calcutta, where they would board a ship to Darwin, Australia. A man named Mr. Shute 
was to meet them there and take them to his home in a town called Alice Springs. Nick's father had chosen Alice Springs because it was of no strategic importance should the Japanese decide to attack Australia. Mia appeared to Nick to be as unhappy about the situation and he was as he was. She wanted to stay in Burma, but seemed to have accepted that going to Australia was the best thing for them to do. Nick had been looking at her a little differently since Inda pointed out how pretty she was. She had a beautiful olive colored complexion, her long black hair shone in the light of the campfire, and she had a wonderful smile. Inda told them that Miss Pretty had once belonged to Mr. Singh and he would be happy to have her back. He had thought he'd never see her again, what with the war and all. Transporting her to India would be his father's payment to Mr. Singh for getting them to the ship. After they fed the elephants, they bedded down, but Nick couldn't fall asleep, and it wasn't the insects, the hard ground, or sore ribs that kept him awake. It was the fact that this was probably the last night he was going to spend with his father in Burma. Unless he came up with a better argument than, I don't want to go. His father was taking a stand. Why wouldn't he allow Nick to stand with, with him? He had just as much to lose as his father did. He thought about this through most of the night, dozing from time to time until the sky started to lighten. Quietly, Nick got up and walked up river, then decided to go for a swim thinking it might do his ribs some good. When he pulled off his pants, he noticed that they were a little looser around the waist. I might just turn into one of those free stones in the portrait yet, he thought. That is, if I get to stay in Burma. He eased himself into the warm water and waded out to the middle of the river. Then he began to float on the gentle current, mindful of his sore ribs. As he floated, a fine mist drifted past the monkey snag 50 feet away. As he swam, he went over the argument he was going to use on his father, but he didn't get very far with it. The elephants began to trumpet. He turned his head toward the sound and saw a dozen men run out of the forest, shouting, brandishing rifles with bayonets. Japanese soldiers! Nick sank deeper into the water and just the top of his head showing and looked toward the camp. His father jumped up, grabbed his rifle, and looked as if he were about to defend the camp. But instead, he dropped his rifle and put his hands up in the air as soldiers swarmed out of the forest. Inda and Mia got to their feet and followed his lead by raising their hands. The soldiers were focused on the campsite and had the seem, seemed to notice that Nick was on, in the river. Nick looked at the tree line. It was too far away. He glanced across to the island. He would never make it across without being seen, but he might be able to, re to reach the snag. If he hid behind it, the soldiers might miss him entirely. He started swimming toward it with just his head above the water, letting the slow current do most of the work. He wasn't certain what he hoped to accomplish if he managed to hide behind the snag but he did not want to be captured by the Japanese. The snag was 20 feet away. An officer shouted something in Japanese, then said in English, down, down. His voice carried well across the water. Inda, Nya, and Nick's father dropped to the, their knees. 15 feet, the soldiers rushed in, 10 feet. His father looked directly at Nick and gave him a slight nod and smile. Nick grabbed the snag. Slowly, he worked his way around to the back side and watched through the gnarled branches and swarming flies feeding on the rotting monkey. With the captives under control, the soldiers appeared to relax. Some lit cigarettes, others started going through their gear. The officer started interrogating Nick's father in Japanese. His father had his head down and appeared to be answering his questions, but Nick was too far away to hear what he was saying. Apparently, the officer didn't like the answers. He raised his fist as if he were going to hit Nick's father. But the blow didn't come, because at that moment, Miss Pretty and Chow came. They came out of the forest 
with mahots on their necks. One of the mahots was Magwe. Inda jumped up and shouted at them. A soldier hit Inda in the stomach with his rifle, doubling him over. Mia was on the soldier in a second, jumping on his back. He threw her off and pointed his bayonet at her. Stop! Nick's father got to his feet. The officer fired his pistol in the air, then said something to the soldier with the bayonet. The soldier gave Mia a vicious kick and walked away. The officer shouted out more orders. Soldiers rushed in and tied their hands. Nick let out a long breath, unaware that he had been holding it. He couldn't believe what he had was seeing. The soldiers handed the padding and the saddles up to Mia, Magwe and the other Mahot. When the saddles were secure, the gear was tossed up to them. Nick stared at his father, hoping for some indication of what he should do, but his father didn't even glance at the snag. They were jerked to their feet and pushed into line, with soldiers on either side of them. Inda was having difficulty standing on his feet. He was in pain. The officer took one final look around camp, then shouted out another order. Nick watched in desire and despair as they all marched away with the elephants in the lead. He wished he hadn't hidden. What was he supposed to do now? Where would he go? He didn't even know the way back to Hawk's Nest. Nick stayed concealed, hidden behind the snag for several minutes. Except for the river and the rattle of dry leaves blowing along the shore, it was quiet. It was almost as if the Japanese had never been there. He looked at his watch. It was 5.30 a.m. The whole incident had taken less than 20 minutes. Was he a coward to have hidden? He wondered. He waded to the shore, feeling ashamed, wondering what else he could have done. He pulled on his pants and put on his shirt. Gray smoke rose from the campfire. The only thing the soldiers had left behind was Hannibal's iron bell. Another reminder of Nick's lack of courage. He'd hidden behind the snag because he was afraid, just as he had stood frozen before Hannibal the day before. Did Mogwe lead the soldiers to them, or had the soldiers forced him to come along in order to get the elephants? It was clear that Inda thought Mogwe had betrayed them, but Nick wasn't so sure. He saw Mogwe's expression when the soldier hit Inda in the stomach. Mogwe seemed almost as upset as Mia, and for a brief moment, Nick thought he was going to jump off his Miss Pretty and join in the fight. But the officer firing his pistol put an end to that. Nick looked up at the sun. It would, be, it would soon be unbearably hot. I'll be fine as long as I stay near the river, he thought. At least I won't die of thirst, but food will be a problem. His father had pointed out a number of edible animals along the way, but he couldn't very well get close enough to kill them with the sergeant major's knife. The only thing Nick could think of to do was to find Hawk's Nest, the Japanese might have already taken it over, but as his father had pointed out, not all of the Burmese were on the Japanese side. Nang would certainly help him. Nick started in the direction the Japanese had taken his father, but he didn't get far. He discovered that some words had been scratched in the dirt near the fire. It was hard to make out, but it looked like follow elephant tracks to Hilltop. Nick looked across the river to the island. He had completely forgotten about Hilltop, but finding him may not be easy. He was certain he could follow the elephant tracks, but he wasn't sure they would lead him to the monk. By now he could be anywhere on the island. It's worth a try, he thought, but if I can't find him, I can always retrace my steps and find Hawk's Nest. He started across the river. Halfway across, he heard a shout behind him. Hand up! Nick froze, then slowly turned his head. Hand up! A Japanese soldier stood on the shore, pointing a rifle at him. Nick looked back at the island. 
80 or 90 feet at the most. Bang! The bullet hit the water not a foot from where Nick was standing. Hand up! Nick put his hands up. He could not believe he had just been shot at. You come back now. I shoot. All thoughts of reaching the island vanished. Nick turned around and started back. Where had the soldiers come from? Did they send him back to look for him? As Nick drew closer, he could see that the man was different from the other soldiers. Older, short, gray hair, glasses. Nick stepped out of the water. Hold hands out. The soldier tied his wrists, then pointed at Nick's feet. How far you think you go without shoe? Nick looked down at his feet and nearly laughed. In his confusion, he had completely forgotten that he was barefoot. He hadn't even gotten very far on the island without his boots, which he saw now were lying on the ground next to the soldier. They must have taken them when they left. They realized there was an extra pair of boots without feet in them. You come with me. In a way, Nick was relieved. At least he'd be with his father now. The soldier pushed him over to the fire. Captain, send me back to find you. Put on shoe. Kind of hard to do with my hands tied, Nick said. You manage. Nick sat down and awkwardly pulled them on, but he was unable to tie them. The soldier gave him an exasperated grunt then squatted down and tied them for him. When he finished, he stood up and pointed to himself. Sergeant Sonji. Nick Freestone, Nick said, although he had a feeling the sergeant already knew that. On feet, Nick got up. Must bow when speak to soldier, the sergeant demonstrated. Keep head down or soldier hit. Whack, whack. Nick wasn't exactly sure what he meant by this, but he bowed. When he brought his head back up, the sergeant was smiling. My English good? Pretty good. Uh, um, it was a lot better than Nick's Japanese, which was non-existent. Who hilltop? It seemed that the sergeant read English as well. The sergeant pointed to the writing near the fire. It, it say here, follow hilltop. Follow elephant to hilltop. You mean what hilltop, Nick said, not who. The sergeant gave him a suspicious look. He couldn't possibly know who hilltop was. It's a place, Nick added, not a person. What place? The plantation house, Nick answered, hawk's nest. The house sat above a river on a plateau, which could be interpreted as a hill. Sergeant Sonji nodded, then rubbed the note out with his boot which was what Nick should have done before he started across the river. The sergeant picked up Hannibal's iron bell. You want? I guess so. The sergeant smiled again, then tied the bell around Nick's waist. This way I find you if you run, like timber elephant. We go. Where? Hilltop, he answered, still smiling. Hawk's nest. Your father's going there. Chapter 11, Sergeant Sonji. The sergeant seemed to be in no hurry to get to Hawk's Nest. He dawdled along the way, stopping to look at animals and plants, as if he were on a nature walk. Nick felt ridiculous with the iron bell clanging around his waist, but he didn't want to ask the sergeant to take it off because he was afraid that he might oblige him and throw it away. Nick wanted the bell. It was the last thing his father had given him. Do you see how the sunlight come through leaf here? Sergeant Sonji asked. Nick saw the leaf and the sunlight, but he didn't see the point. Now that he had been captured, all he wanted was to see his father. He was worried about him. The soldiers who had taken him were nothing like the soldier who had taken Nick. You thirsty? Nick shook his head. He had already drunk, his most, drunk most of the water in the sergeant's canteen. You see cricket? Now what was he talking about? Nick was beginning to think the sergeant was crazy. Look, he exposed the leaf's underside. Cricket, you know haiku? Is that the Japanese word for cricket? 
The sergeant laughed. No, haiku is Japanese poetry. As we walk by, I hear cricket chirp. The sergeant was crazy. I think of haiku. He picked up a sharp stick. Better in Japan language, but I write haiku in English for you. Cricket, beneath dew-covered leaf. One final chirp. See, the soldier beamed at him. Japan poetry, haiku. Nick saw, but he didn't understand why the strange soldier was making up poetry or why he thought Nick would be interested, which he wasn't. As they continued on, Nick searched the dusty trail for his father's boot prints. They were difficult to pick out from all the others, but when he saw one, he breathed a sigh of relief. If his father was on his feet, he was still alive. What's going to happen to us? Nick asked. The sergeant gave him a, sim a sympathetic look. For a colonel to decide. The officer who came into the camp this morning? No, that man captain. Colonel Nagayoshi in command. He wait for us at Hawk's Nest. So the Japanese had taken over Hawk's Nest, Nick thought. What's he like? The sergeant thought about it for a moment before answering. Bushido, he finally said. What's that? Warrior, he answered. Samurai, must show great respect, or he held his hands over his head, then brought them down, making a whooshing sound. He chops off people's heads? Sometime. With my own eyes, I have seen this. Deserter, coward, we catch, and the colonel? He made the motion again. Nick's anxiety must have shown because the sergeant gave him a gentle pat on the shoulder. I think you'll be okay. And my father? A worried look flickered across the sergeant's face. He be okay, maybe. Must hurry now. Getting late. He cut the rope holding the bell and put it in his rucksack. I keep. Give you later. They reached the elephant village late that afternoon. It had changed dramatically since Nick's last visit. A dead dog lay in the middle of the road with his head crushed. Not far from the dog was a butchered pig. Many of the bamboo houses had been ransacked. Two had been burned to the ground. There were no villagers to be seen, but there were plenty of Japanese soldiers squatting in the shade beneath the houses, staring as the sergeant marched Nick through the dusty street. Several of them called out to Sunjai as they passed, but he didn't respond. His face was emotionless. He postured ramrod straight, looking nothing like the poet of an hour before. Hawk's nest had changed too. Hanging above the porch was a huge Japanese flag, its red sun fluttering in the warm breeze. Beneath it were two dead bodies, Nang and Captain Joseph's. Nang had been horribly beaten and was barely recognizable. Captain Josephs had been decapitated. They had cut off his head. Nick threw up. The entire elephant village was seated on the ground in front of Hawk's Nest. They were separated into groups with the women and children on the left side of the house and the men on the right. Both groups were surrounded by soldiers his father was kneeling between the two groups, his hands still tied, and he didn't appear to know that Nick was there. Nick looked at Sonjai. The sergeant gave him a nearly imperceptible head shake, which Nick took to mean that he didn't know what was going on either. Nick wiped his mouth, then looked for Mia among the women and children, but he couldn't see her from where he was. Two soldiers came through the front door of Hawk's Nest. Slumped between them was Inda. He had been beaten. There was a scream of anguish from someone in the woman's group, which was quickly muffled. The soldiers dragged Inda around the side of the house out of sight, and for a horrible moment, Nick thought they were going to shoot him. He held his breath, wanting not to hear the shot, but waiting for it, but it didn't come. The soldiers came back around the house without Inda and took up positions in front of the men. 
One of them pulled out a sheet of paper from his tunic pocket and looked like he was going to call out a name from it. Then the other soldier noticed the sergeant and Nick standing in the back. He waved them forward. Time now to show respect, Sonjai whispered. Is one of them the colonel? He shook his head and pushed Nick forward. Chapter 12, Colonel Nagayoshi. Nick kept his head bowed the entire time the soldiers talked to Sergeant Sonji. When they finished, Sonji pushed Nick over to where his father was and made him kneel beside him. You all right? His father asked. I'm fine, Nick answered. I I'm sorry I didn't... No talking, Sergeant Sonji s slapped Nick on the head but not too hard. I come back. He marched up the steps of Hawk's Nest and disappeared through the front door. As they kneeled, Nick noticed the terrible stench in the air. It smelled terrible. It was the same smell that had come from the monkey on the snag. Nang and Captain Josephs had been dead for some time. They may have been killed as early as the day before, when Nick was on the island. The sergeant came back outside 15 minutes later, followed by an officer. Every soldier snapped to attention. He was tall. His uniform was immaculate. A sword and pistol hung from his lean waist. He shouted out some orders, and a handful of soldiers ran forward. They picked up Nang's and Captain Joseph's bodies and carried them around the side of the house. When the corpses were gone, the officer stepped off the porch and walked over to where Nick and his father were kneeling. <clears throat> My name is Colonel Yaganoshi, he said in perfect English with an American accent. Hold your arms out. Nick looked at his father. He nodded, and they did as they asked. Nick had read newspaper accounts of the Japanese maiming and torturing prisoners. They usually did it publicly as a warning to others. The colonel pulled his sword from the, his scarab. Nick flinched and lowered his arms. Sergeant Sonji rushed forward and jerked his arms up. Be brave, he whispered in Nick's ears, then stepped away. Nick managed to keep his arms out, but he couldn't stop from shaking. The colonel brought his sword up, pausing with the blade above his head, then brought it straight down stopping within an inch of the ground. Nick stared at him in defiance with his arms still out, determined not to move or flinch. The colonel gave him a slight bow, then positioned himself in front of his father, whose arms were as solid as a teak plank. Again, the blade hissed, narrowly missing his father's forehead in its downward arc. Without another word, the colonel returned the sword to its scarab, then headed back up to the steps into Hawk's Nest. Impressive scoundrel, Nick's father muttered under his breath. More like a common bully, Nick thought. What was he trying to prove with the sword play? It wasn't until he lowered his hands that Nick understood what his father was saying. The rope around his wrists had been cut clean through. Nick stared at his numb hands in astonishment. He hadn't even felt the blade cut through the ropes. The colonel was impressive. Are you hurt? His father asked under his breath. No, I can't believe. No talking, Sergeant Sonji said. The soldiers with the list got back to business by calling out two names. The Mahot stood and they were escorted, escorted into the house. Ten minutes later, they came back out. One was taken to the side of the house. The other was sent back to the, with the men in front of the house. More names were called. Some were sent back to the men's group. Others were sent to the side of the house. Just before sunset, the last three men were sent into Hawk's Nest. Nick recognized them. They all had been with Mogwai at the training camp. When they came back out, they were told to sit with the other men still in front of the house. 
Were the Japanese segregating the men into those who were sympathetic and those who weren't? The answer came a moment later when Mogwai stepped out onto the porch without an escort. He had been inside the whole time, no doubt telling Colonel Nagayoshi who was on his side and who wasn't. He began speaking to the assembly in Burmese. Nick looked at his father expecting to see anger, or at least irritation, but instead he just looked sad. When Mogwai finished, the, finished, the villagers all got up and started walking quietly down to the village. His father watched his people leave, nodding at the few who acknowledged him, but most of them walked by without so much as a glance in his direction. As darkness fell, the generator started up and the lights came on inside Hawk's Nest. The last person to leave was Mogwai. Unlike the others, he stopped in front of them and said something in Burmese. His father said something back. Mogwai nodded and walked away. He apologized, his father explained. What did you say? I told him that the people were his responsibility now. The hours passed slowly. Dozens of trucks came and went, dumping supplies and more Japanese soldiers. The Japanese had arrived in force, and it looked like Hawk's Nest was their new headquarters. Nick was thirsty, hungry, and his ribs were killing him. His father asked Sonji if he could stand and stretch, but he said they were to remain where they were by the colonel's orders. Softening us up his father said. For what? Sonji slapped him on the back of their heads. No talking. Very serious. Nick barely felt the slap above his other aches and pains, but he remained quiet, and so did his father. More time passed. An hour? Two? Nick was getting weak and dizzy. It was all he could do to stop himself from pitching forward onto his face. Finally, the captain who had captured his father came onto the porch and barked out an order. Sergeant Sonji snapped to attention. We go inside now. You stand. Standing was much easier said than done. Nick had to get up in stages, waiting for the shooting pains to subside, before making his next move. When he finally got to his feet, his knees buckled. He grabbed onto his father and nearly pulled him down. Sonji put an arm around his waist and put his hand under Nick's arm to help support him. This is how they walked through the front door of Hawk's Nest. As they stepped into the entry hall, Nick glanced into the dining room. Half a dozen soldiers were sitting around the table eating dinner under the watchful eye of Bu Kong. He gave Nick a slight nod as they were escorted into the library. Colonel Nagayoshi was sitting behind the helm of the big desk, sorting through a stack of papers. He didn't look up when Nick and his father were brought in. Hanging behind him was a Japanese flag and a photo of Emperor Hirohito. The Colonel's sword was displayed beneath the flag on a black enameled rack. Nick's cigar box was sitting on the desk and his lead soldiers carefully arranged on top. His father's rucksack was sitting next to it. The colonel finally looked up and said something. He said something to Sergeant Sonji in Japanese. Sonji retrieved a chair and gestured for Nick to take a seat. I'm fine, Nick said, although if his father let go of him, he wasn't sure he could stay on his feet. Sit down, his father said. Reluctantly, Nick eased himself into the chair. The colonel regarded both of them for a moment, then said, The combination to the safe. Nick's father <coughs> cleared his parched throat. <coughs> um, right, um, right eight, uh, left thirty-one, right twenty-seven. Nick glanced up at him in surprise. He hadn't hesitated to give the colonel the combination. And August 31st was Nick's birthday. 
Sergeant Sonji turned the spindle, then pulled open the heavy door. The colonel got up and disappeared inside. After a few moments, he came back out and resumed his seat behind the helm. He pointed to the ashes in the fireplace. It appears, Mr. Freestone, that you were expecting us. His father ignored the comment. What happened to Captain Jacobs and Captain Josephs? I executed him, the colonel answered. Why? He was my enemy. His father gave him an angry glare. And Nang? An unfortunate accident. My men were told not to harm the Burmese, but in the heat of battle. The colonel shrugged his shoulders. Battle? His father raised his voice. What battle? There aren't any weapons here. Nang did not resist. Why was he beaten to death? The colonel looked at him for a few moments before answering. The man responsible will be punished, he said. His father stare, started to say something, then took a deep breath, no doubt trying to cool his freestone blood. And the men you took around back, he asked. They will be sent to a work camp. Why? Nick's father asked. They're Burmese. They aren't your enemies. Their families are here on the plantation. I think you know why, Mr. Freestone. The two men stared at each other. After a few seconds, the colonel said, Their family's presence here will assure the men's cooperation while they are in the labor camp. Hostages, his father said. Do you think their wives and children would be better off in a labor camp? No, the colonel shrugged. Sounds like you plan on staying. It's very comfortable, the colonel said, looking around the library. Our soldiers may have something to say about that when they find you out here. Unlikely, Mr. Freestone. The bombings of Rangoon started yesterday. It will not be long before it falls. In the meantime, your army is going to be too preoccupied to worry about the teak plantation in the jungle. Where is this labor camp? His father asked. Some distance from here, I'm afraid. It will be a difficult journey. A death march, Nick thought. He had read about them in a newspaper. It was rumored that the Japanese didn't actually have camps. To take care of the prisoner situation, they marched them for weeks or months until they died of starvation or disease. This way they didn't have to feed or take care of their prisoners. The colonel stood. You will be going with them, Mr. Freestone. It is only fitting that you stay with the men who are loyal to you. Nick's father gave him a stoic nod. The colonel looked at Nick, then back at his father. I know the British consider the Japanese barbarians, but the truth is that our culture has existed much longer than your own. We are anything but barbarians. He walked over to the window and looked outside, then turned back to them. We have something in common, Mr. Freestone, he pointed to Nick. I, too, have a son. Unfortunately, he is, and his mother are in America. I was there myself until a year ago. That's where you learned English. The colonel nodded. San Francisco. The emperor called me home. My wife and son remained behind. I felt they would be safer there. Now I am not so certain. I have not heard from them since the bombings of Pearl Harbor. The colonel walked back to the helm and picked up one of Nick's lead soldiers. I understand that you were trying to get your son out of Burma. Yes. Where? Australia, via India. I am sorry you did not succeed. The colonel started to put the soldiers back into the box one at a time. I have a proposition for you. He put the last soldier into the box and closed the lid. Leave the boy here on the plantation. When I get the opportunity, I will send him to India. No, Nick protested, getting out of the chair. 
the colonel didn't take his eyes off Nick's father. That is exactly how my son reacted when I told him I was returning to Japan without him. He will be much safer here than where you are going. I'll take my chances, Nick said. The colonel continued, staring at Nick's father. Decide. Now? His father asked. Yes. You and the other men are leaving here in a few minutes. Nick knew what his father's decision was before he opened his mouth. Don't do this, he pleaded. Please, please. Sergeant Sonji will take personal responsibility for the boy's safety, the colonel said. I just hope the Americans show my son and wife the same consideration. Nick's father looked at him. You're in no condition to travel, son. You can barely stand. I was fine on the plantation today, Nick protested. On elephant back, his father put his hand on Nick's shoulder. This is the only way. He looked at the colonel. May I speak to my son alone? The colonel thought about it for a moment, then nodded and walked out of the library with Sergeant Sonji. I'll run away, Nick said. There's nowhere to run. You, you can't make it to India alone on foot. This isn't right, Nick said. It's not the way I wanted it either, but it's your best chance. You don't really think Colonel Nagayoshi is going to send me to India. Why else would he make the offer, his father said. Regardless, you'll be much safer here than with me. He lowered his voice. Listen, I have no intention of spending the war in a bloody labor camp. It will be a long march, and we are better suited to this climate than the Japanese. If I don't manage to escape on the way, I'll escape from the camp. The point is, I am coming back to Hawk's Nest. If the colonel hasn't sent you by off by then, I'll get you out myself. How? I'm not sure, but I'll figure it out. In the meantime, you need to just let those ribs heal. Keep your head down when you're here. And I mean that literally. Bow to them, even when you don't want to. No matter how humiliating it is, you need to keep yourself safe and healthy. Nick didn't like it but he knew his father was right. He was in no shape to travel. If he insisted on tagging along, his father would never escape. We don't have much time, his father continued. Not even the colonel is leaving here. And he is loyal to the Japanese. This means Magwe, or whoever was feeding him information, doesn't know everything that's going on. We still have friends in the plantation. Who? Your best source of information for, for that will be Hilltop. What if the Japanese find him and send him away? They wouldn't dare. He is untouchable. They would have a riot on their hands, and not just here. Every Burman in the country would be up in arms. His father opened his rucksack and took out the diary Nick had given him. He scribbled something down on one of the pages and tore it out. This is the contact information for Mr. Singh in India. If you get there, all you have to do is tell him who you are, and he'll take care of the rest. What about Mia? His father paused for a moment. When you see Hilltop, tell him that I want her to go with you to Australia. He should be able to manage it with the colonel. In the meantime, keep an eye on her. I, I will, Nick said. One more thing, his father lowered his voice. I need you to tell, I need to tell you something about the house. There are secret. The colonel and Sergeant Sonji walked back into the library, followed by Bukong leaning on his bamboo cane. The colonel looked suspiciously at the piece of blue paper Nick was holding in his hand. I gave Nick the contact information in India, his father explained. Good. The colonel took the paper. His father picked up his rucksack and slipped the strap over his shoulder. He bowed to the colonel and thanked him for his consideration which Nick thought was more for his benefit than the colonel's. He was showing Nick how to act when he was there. You will not have many guards on your journey, the colonel said. It's only fair that I warn you as I have the others. If something happens, dur happens during your trip, an escape attempt, for instance, the family members that remain here will be punished. He looked at Nick, severely punished. I understand, his father said. The colonel gave him a crisp 
bow and said, It is time to leave. And then he bowed. I guess I'll see you after all this is over, his father, giving Nick a hug. It hurt his ribs, but Nick didn't care. He squeezed his father back with all his strength. His father broke away, gave him a smile, then walked out of the library with Sergeant Sonji. Wukong will show you to your room, the colonel said. Nick couldn't find his voice, but he managed to give him a bow, which made his ribs scream. He followed Bukong back out of the library, hoping to catch a final look at his father, but he had already gone. He started toward the stairs, thinking that he might be able to see him from his balcony. No, Bukong, this way. But my... This way, he repeated. They walked through the dining room. The soldiers had finished eating, and the table had been cleared. Bukong opened the door to the kitchen. Nick thought he might be taking him out back to see his father. Certainly, Bukong was on his side. The kitchen staff was busy washing dishes. Nick looked at each of them, trying to determine which of them might be sympathetic. None of them made eye contact with him. Bukong led him into the servant's hallway. At the end was a back door leading to the garden. Nick was certain now he was taking him to see his father, but halfway down the hall, Bukong stopped in front of the door to his old nursery. What's this? Bukong pushed the door open. Nick's trunk was on the bed. Bukong smiled, then hit him on the shoulder with his cane and pushed him into the room. Nick fell against the bed table. His cowboy lamp shattered into a hundred, hundred pieces. You are no longer the little master of this house, Bukong said, then slammed the door. The lock snapped into place. Shocked by the hit and in pain from the fall, Nick lay still for a moment. The room was pitch black except for the dim moonlit light coming through the barred window. Slowly he pulled himself up and looked outside, hoping for one final look at his father. A guard walked by the barrel window. Beyond him, all Nick could see was the jungle. It would be ten months before he heard from his father again.